The third-person point of view is the most commonly used way to narrate a story. The writer places himself as the invisible observer in his character's lives and takes note of the events unfolding before him. But for Michael, the protagonist in this movie, using the third-person point of view allows him a certain freedom when it comes to his emotions. We see Michael alone in his hotel room in Paris, having a hard time typing the words onto his laptop. He's an acclaimed novelist and is currently writing his new piece, but a lot of things are weighing on his mind. His son Robbie has just passed away due to drowning. As a form of escape, he fled to Paris to concentrate on his novel. As he contemplates his work, he hears a child's voice whispering, Watch me. This may look like a thriller movie at first, but after all the events unfold, one may come up with a sad conclusion and understand his predicament. In the next scene, we see Elaine, Michael's wife, standing by the edge of the pool. She looks like she's about to dive into it, but fear, anxiety, and hesitation are clearly written on her face. In the end, she doesn't dive. Instead, she grabs her robe and enters her house. After changing clothes, she talks to someone, and the conversation turns sour. Irritated, she mindlessly throws her phone into the sink, but it falls into a pan full of water. When she sees her son's face as the screen turns black, her irritation grows. It's not only Michael's story that we see in this movie, there are two more that play parallel with each other. The second character we see is Julia, who looks like she's late for her work. Just as she's about to leave, she passes by her son's empty bedroom. She misses her son, but she vows to see him soon. Julia runs across the busy streets of New York, Finally, she arrives at attorney Teresa Lowry's office. Julia recites a string of hurried apologies, but the lawyer cuts her off. Teresa always hears the same lame excuses about how things are not Julia's fault, that she's trying her best to fix her messy life. She informs her that the judge has allowed a second psychiatric test, but Julia doesn't feel positive about it. You see, Julia is fighting a custody battle for her son because of an unfortunate incident. Julia insists that what happened to her son was an accident and that she was just trying to save his life. But Teresa emphasizes she only has one chance to prove she's mentally stable, and that is through the psychiatric evaluation. The meeting will be tomorrow, so Julia better make some adjustments. Julia's son is currently living with Richard Weiss, her ex-husband, and her son's father. Richard, or Rick, is a successful artist known for his hand paintings, but has a troubled relationship with his son. We see him trying to engage the child in his art process, but the boy doesn't appreciate it. He wipes his painted hands onto a canvas, which annoys Rick. He almost throws a towel on the child and then walks away. Sam, Rick's current girlfriend, is more understanding of the boy's mood. She tends to the boy's hand and manages to draw a smile out of him. The third important character in this film is Scott. He's an American businessman doing some shady work in Rome. He steals designs from high-end fashion brands so he can forward them to his associates who facilitate sweatshops. Scott wears a tux, making him look like a wealthy businessman, but only someone with a good eye knows his clothes are fake. He enters a bar, where a news report about a bomb is being broadcast. He places his orders, but he gets hostile service from the bartender. Still, he stays to have his lukewarm beer. Then, a woman opens the bar's door. As she's framed in the entrance, Scott can't help but admire the woman's physique. She's tall, lean, and has curves in all the right places. But what gets his attention is her mysterious aura and feisty stance. He notices she carries a lot of bags, and he knows immediately she's a gypsy. He should be careful around her, but there's nothing wrong with admiring her from a distance. Going back to Michael, he's still stuck in his writing. Then he receives a call from the receptionist. He says that a certain Anna Barr is looking for him. Michael jokingly asks if she's armed, but apparently the receptionist doesn't get his humor. He tells him to send the woman upstairs instead. A few minutes later, he receives a knock on his door. It's Anna, and instead of being happy to see him, she scolds him for flying her to Paris on points. She hands him her short story for him to review. They both act nonchalantly toward each other, even bordering on indifference, but one can sense a sensual tension between them. They go back and forth teasing each other until Anna grabs her purse and leaves the suite. She hasn't taken a few steps away when Michael heaves her up on his shoulders, brings her back into his suite, and plops her onto his bed. Then he starts to undress her, and they both have a hot tryst. Anna is Michael's paramour. She's an ambitious journalist who wants to be a writer. She treats her relationship with Michael as a stepping stone towards her goals. But she's also tempestuous, often making snide remarks towards her lover or anything else. After their coupling, while Anna reads Michael's journal, she receives a message from a man named Daniel, who tells her he'll be arriving in Paris that night, and he needs to see her. She ignores it and continues reading. After he showers, Michael gives her a gift. It's an expensive red dress, which he thinks will suit her. 
Anna is good at hiding her glee at receiving the gift. She remains unconcerned even after thanking him. They go out to have a stroll along the streets of Paris. While he's looking at an artwork made by the artist Richard Weiss, Anna presses him on when he's going to review her short story. Michael only laughs. She changes the topic and asks him about the novel he's currently writing. He thinks it may not be good enough, but his publisher, Jake, is already reading the first few chapters, so he'll hear from him soon. Anna reminds him that he's a Pulitzer recipient. There's no way his writing will stink. It's also the only reason she's with him. He takes her comment in stride, as he knows it's not entirely true. When she asks him again about his novel, he finally reveals that it's about a man who can only feel through the characters he creates. However, the novel's direction seems to be unclear, so he doesn't know how to deal with it. For the rest of their walk, they spend it humoring each other, like any other normal couple. They return to the hotel. Michael is surprised that Anna won't be staying with him in his suite. It turns out she's booked her own room, and he doesn't like it. Anna doesn't like how he's reacting either. Yes, they're having an affair, but it doesn't have to be in broad daylight. She says people are already talking about them, and she needs to protect her reputation. Michael gives in and says sorry, but she sighs in exasperation, saying he says that too often it has lost its meaning. Back in New York, Julia is rushing towards her job after her meeting with the lawyer. This is her new job, and she's anxious that she might lose it again. She meets her supervisor, who seems to be her acquaintance. She can't help but tell him her predicament, that everyone is tired of hearing the same old story. When the supervisor asks her if she's sure about this job, Julia says she badly needs it, saying she has no means to pay the bills if she doesn't take it. The supervisor empathizes with her and offers her a spot at the reception since she's very pretty. But she opts to go with being a hotel maid, because no one looks at maids. She admits she never did before. He understands. He points her to where she can put her things and reminds her to wear her uniform. Julia used to be an actress. When she got pregnant, she left the limelight to focus on her child. But because of the circumstances of her custody battle with Rick, she has lost her resources and is now forced to work as a maid in a hotel. The other maid who is training her empathizes with her, saying a man always gets a woman pregnant. Julia reflects on this reality of her life, but she quickly focuses on the job at hand. After her shift, she spends a few minutes looking up at Rick's apartment. She's not allowed to see her son, so all she can do is stare and wish she could win him back. In Rome, Scott continues to look at the woman. He sees that the bartender is immune to the woman's beauty, serving her a glass of limoncello with the same hostility. After a few minutes, the woman confronts Scott. Her name is Monica, and she demands to know why he keeps looking at her. Scott says he only wants to know what she's drinking. Monica thinks otherwise, but she's impressed at his subtlety in flirting. After getting served the liquor by the grumpy bartender, Scott apologizes for looking, and he admits it's very hard not to look at her. After giving him a once-over from head to toe, Monica decides Scott is safer than most men she meets. They sit there by the bar throwing occasional looks at each other while minding their own business and taking increasing shots of limoncello. Then, Scott checks his phone to listen to a recording made by his daughter. Monica doesn't want to ask at first, but she has this expression on her face that compels Scott to ask. She says she has an eight-year-old daughter whom she'll meet tomorrow after two years. Scott makes a toast for both of their children. The chill atmosphere gets disturbed by the shrill of phone ringing. Monica rushes to answer it, but the bartender is being a dickhead by increasing the bar television's volume. Ignoring this, she grabs an envelope filled with thick cash from her bag, pulls out a bill, and then gestures to Scott to hand her a pen. She writes what looks like a phone number on the bill. After the call, Monica looks agitated. She doesn't mind him, as she replaces her heels with comfortable shoes. After grabbing her bags, she leaves in urgency, but not before returning the pen to Scott and saying thank you. Scott is baffled, but he chooses to remain seated and finish his drink. That's when he notices that Monica has forgotten one of her bags, the one from which she pulled out the envelope with cash. He grabs the bag and tells the bartender about it. The bartender doesn't speak nor understand English, but he immediately concludes that the woman earlier left a bag that contained a bomb. Suddenly everyone in the bar is panicking and rushes out, leaving Scott in a more baffled manner. After making sure that there are no dangerous objects inside the bag, he follows the men outside to explain. One of them understands English, and he also confirms Scott is telling the truth. But the others still don't believe him. Exasperated, Scott shoves the bag toward the man and leaves them. That night, Scott returns to his hotel room, but his mind is still on Monica. He decides to return to the bar and see what has happened. He returns to the bar, and he sees Monica is already arguing with the bartender. She demands that he return her money. But the bartender points at Scott, saying he's the one who found her bag, 
and therefore, he has her money. Monica insists it's with the bartender. Insulted, the latter grabs her and pushes her out of the bar. Scott can only follow her while calling the bartender a dickhead. After following Monica and waiting for her to calm down, Scott learns that the cash was for her daughter. She says someone has put her daughter on a boat for 5,000 euros, but she's now held hostage. Monica needs to pay 5,000 more to get her daughter back. Scott offers to give her the money. Monica thinks he's offering the cash for a quick tryst, but he corrects her, saying he doesn't see her as someone like that. It's getting late, and she has no choice. So she comes with him to his hotel. But the receptionist, after taking one look at her, says there's no more room left for her. Feeling ridiculed, Monica chooses to sleep at the station. To her surprise, Scott follows her, bringing with him all of his luggage. He reiterates that he's not after her body, that he's only there to help her. Going back to Michael, he attempts to write again, but he's distracted by the fact that Anna is not there with him. He tries to call her, but Anna stubbornly refuses to answer. It doesn't help that she gets another text from Daniel, telling her he's arrived at his hotel. Again, she ignores the message. After a few minutes of thinking, Anna decides to visit Michael in his suite. She's only wearing robes with nothing beneath. She teases Michael about taking his robe earlier and feels bad for not returning it. She then undresses, right in front of him, to show that she's sincere in returning the garment. Michael feels happy inside, knowing that Anna has forgiven him for his reaction earlier. He takes one good, appreciative look at her body, before grabbing the robe and closing the door right on her face. Anna is rightfully flabbergasted, but she's also giddy that her lover can do this to her. She begs Michael to give her back her room card, which is inside one of the pockets. After retrieving it, she runs back to her room, giggling childishly. The hotel security has a feast upon looking at one of their guests through the cameras, running along the hallway, with nothing but a smile on her face. Michael returns to his seat to continue writing. But now, his mind is full of Anna. He decides to finally read her short story, and evaluate its value. The next day in New York, Julia is almost late to work again. It seems like ever since her separation from Rick, her life has been a string of unfortunate events. While cleaning one of the suites, she receives a call from Teresa. The lawyer sounds irate about the sudden changes in her schedule. She tells Julia that the psychiatrist who is supposed to evaluate her has decided to change the venue of their meeting to her office. Teresa is about to send Julia the address, but the latter says she has no more minutes left, as she's on a prepaid phone. Instead, Julia grabs a paper and a pen from the table and writes down the address. But she abruptly cuts the call as the suite owner enters the room. Startled, she accidentally pushes the ashtray off the table. Julia cleans up her mess hurriedly. Then she murmurs a soft apology as she leaves the room. She doesn't realize that she's left the paper on which she wrote the psychiatrist's address. Back in Paris, Michael calls Anna to come to his suite. He's ready to give his critique of her short story. He starts by saying her story is well-crafted and clever, to which she makes a snide remark. Michael stops her there, and Anna realizes she's being disrespectful. He continues, saying she could have written her story in a more personal manner, because her work comes across as cold. Anna continues to make snide remarks about his comments, then insists she can take criticism from her editors. Michael puts her in her place, saying her editorials on society are on par with editorials on women's wear daily. Their tense conversation gets interrupted by a call from Michael's wife. Elaine says she lost her phone, and she's lamenting the fact that it contains a lot of photos of their late son, Robbie. When she says she has a new number, Michael gets up to write it. Curiously, he writes the number on a paper that suspiciously looks the same as the paper where Julia wrote the address of the psychiatrist. Elaine then says she misses him. Looking at Anna, Michael then goes inside the bedroom to continue his conversation with his wife. He says he's sorry, to which she replies, it's okay. She says he loves love but it's people he doesn't have time for. This implies that Michael only likes the idea of love and being in love, but he doesn't know how to show it to people he likes being in love with. Outside, Anna grabs the paper and puts it in her pocket, then pretends as if nothing happened. When Michael's conversation ends, she walks to him and makes a rude comment about his wife. It seems like Elaine has an idea about Anna, but Michael has told her Anna is not present. Anna keeps making hurtful comments. Fed up, he tells her to stop. He reveals he left his wife weeks ago because he's fallen in love with someone else. Anna scoffs. It's ridiculous, and even more so, if she's the woman he's fallen for. She taunts Michael, saying she'll never return his feelings, and adds he doesn't even know what love means. She walks out on him. When she returns to her room, Anna pulls out the paper and attempts to call the number on it to tell Elaine about her and spite Michael, but she drops the call. 
She's fuming with rage because Michael has no spine to even tell his wife who she is. She also feels jealous because she thinks she'll never have what Michael has given his wife. Still fuming, she throws the paper in a drawer and then takes a shower. To cool off his head, Michael decides to go out and meet his publisher Jake. He's in Paris to attend their book fair, as well as to give his thoughts on Michael's draft. First, Jake asks how Elaine is doing, then he asks about Anna. Apparently, even though they keep it a secret, Jake knows about their affair. Then, he goes straight to the point. He tells Michael they're not going to publish his novels. He makes some excuses about how their target market has changed over time. But Michael doesn't accept this. He demands Jake tell him the real reason why his book won't be published. Jake obliges him, and his words are as frank and biting as they can be. Jake says his first novel was phenomenal, but there was a decline in his succeeding books. He says all Michael has in his novels are random characters making excuses for his own life, characters written in the third person, but detached, and trying hard to justify the author's life. Jake's words are like wake-up slaps for Michael. He can't fault Jake, because he's fully aware of what he's writing. Jake leaves him there, contemplating what's next. Meanwhile in Rome, Monica has acquired a car. After entering it, Scott gives her the money he promised the night before. But he wants to hold on to it until he sees that she gives it to the people holding her daughter. Monica can't believe the American just won't let her go. She steps on the gas and almost runs into tourists who are strolling on the piazza. After driving for almost the entire afternoon, they finally arrive at some town outskirts that don't look safe. Scott still insists on accompanying Monica into the bar. There they meet Carlo, a member of the Italian Mafia. Carlo is impressed that Monica has managed to snag a wealthy American. He takes this opportunity to con both Monica and Scott. He says Monica actually owes him 10,000 euros, and because Scott chose to help her, he now owes him 25,000 euros. Without the money, he won't show Monica's daughter. Monica is enraged. He accuses Scott of making things difficult for her. She demands that he give her back the money. Instead, he accuses her of scamming him. Either Carlo is the mastermind or the accomplice. Still, she's adamant about getting her money back. After Scott gives her the envelope, she immediately looks for the bill where she wrote Carlo's number. It's proof that Scott indeed took her money. She then drives off, leaving Scott stranded there. Good thing he has his passport and credit card on him. He manages to get into a cheap hostel. Alone in the dark, Scott contemplates why he's so intent on helping Monica. He's a con man himself, doing business by stealing fashion designs, so it shouldn't be his concern whatever happens to her and her daughter. However, after listening to his daughter's recorded message for the nth time, he realizes he can't let another parent suffer from being separated from her own child. A part of him still thinks this is all part of an elaborate plan to exploit him, so he must choose his next step carefully. Back in New York, Julia's getting ready to go to the psychiatrist's office. However, she finally finds out she's missing the piece of paper where she wrote the address. She frantically returns to the room where she wrote it, but it's not there anymore. In the meantime, waiting for her in front of the office is Teresa, along with Rick and Sam. Teresa texts Julia about her whereabouts, but it fails to send. Julia has gone down to the store next to the hotel to buy a phone card. She realizes that if she spends her money even on the cheapest phone card, she won't have enough for a taxi fare. Still, Julia chooses to buy it. Eventually, she calls Teresa and explains her predicament. Teresa sets aside her annoyance and urges Julia to hasten. But the city traffic isn't kind to Julia. When she arrives at the office, she's 45 minutes late. The doctor says it's considered a no-show. She also adds that there's no need for her to evaluate Julia, given the previous reports about her heinous act towards her son. Teresa expresses unfairness despite understanding that there's nothing she can do. Rick and Sam have also left, feeling annoyed that Julia has wasted their time. Teresa confronts Julia and asks her how she can be so irresponsible. Julia wants to explain, but to Teresa, her reasons are the same old story of, it's not my fault, I did everything I could. This meeting should have been the most important thing if Julia really wanted to fight for her son. Teresa says it's almost certain she won't win the battle, and Julia will have to be very lucky to see her son again. With that, she leaves. Julia is in despair. Inside the women's bathroom she cries her heart out. In her mind, she has done everything she can to fight for her son. But why do things conspire against her? All she wants is to prove that she's capable, that she can do better, and get her life in order. She continues to cry not noticing that another woman is inside one of the cubicles. It's Sam, and she's just finished smoking. When she comes out, she sees the pitiful woman crying on the floor. Sam is about to leave but decides to ask if the woman is okay. Julia looks up and sees the pretty woman talking to her. 
Perhaps for the first time, someone has shown Julia the kindness and understanding she badly needed. It's not implied whether Sam knows her, but her empathy might have saved Julia from spiraling further. In Rome, Scott finally decides to withdraw enough money to help Monica. He calls Carlo to ask where he can meet him. After a few hours, Scott is walking into one of Carlo's bases. Inside, Monica is already waiting, as if she's been told about this meeting. Scott gives the money to Carlo, who looks amused. Carlo asks him the most reasonable question in their situation. Why is he helping Monica? Scott just met her at the bar, and he decided to get involved with her affairs. He's not even sure if the daughter is real. If Scott is really as stupid and wealthy as he looks, then it shouldn't be a problem for him to pay 100 euros. This causes a small altercation among the three of them, in which Carlo pulls out his gun. He points it at Scott and says, if he can't pay him the money, the girl will be working in the streets tomorrow. With no other choice, Scott and Monica leave. Meanwhile in Paris, Anna receives a call from Michael, inviting her to breakfast, but she refuses, saying she's meeting a friend. Michael panics, as he realizes this friend might be who he thinks he is. He runs out of his room to catch Anna, just in time to see her in front of the elevator. She looks modest, far from the alluring Anna from the past few days. Michael begs her not to go. But Anna's way of deterring him is through harsh words and humiliation. She tells him that, as a actress, she has the upper hand in their relationship because she can't be hurt and she can leave any time. She sarcastically advises him to find someone who can give him the love he likes. Anna arrives at the hotel where she's supposed to meet that friend, who turns out to be Daniel. And Daniel isn't exactly her friend, but her father. Michael knows about this, and this is why he's begging her not to come. After a few hours, Anna gets up and picks up her clothes, leaving her father sleeping on the bed. She returns to her hotel, looking deranged. She knows what she's doing is wrong, but she can't find the strength to stop it. When she enters her room, she's taken aback by the white roses. Several vases containing bouquets line the walls, and some are even on the floor. There's only one person who can do this. Immediately, she runs to Michael's room. She asks why he's so weak, and why he is showing her kindness when all she's ever shown him is her ugly side. Michael carries her to bed as she continues to cry. Eventually, she calms down. As it turns out, she hates what she has been doing, and she's projecting all that hate on the only one who's willing to be with her. She has never thought she deserved love, but it hurts her to think that she can have it from a man she humiliated for being weak in loving her. Later, she receives a call from Daniel. He asks why she left him. After gathering her courage, Anna finally reveals to her father that she's with someone, and she can't come back. Daniel tries to persuade her daughter, saying she'll only get hurt. But Anna ends the call by asking for forgiveness for everything she's done. She's made up her mind to do the right thing. Back in Rome, Scott finds where Monica has been staying all this time. She enters a derelict trailer, where she immediately pulls out drawers to look for her pistol. Scott confronts her but she hits him with a pan, as she demands to know why he's helping her. Finally, he admits that he doesn't know. Perhaps he's a fool, either for wanting to see her again, or for saving the day. But he asks her why she left the bag in the bar. No one leaves something that important, so it's obvious to him that she set him up to be the victim. He reveals that he's not as rich as she thinks, that he steals design and makes a living out of it. Monica feels defeated, but she's used to wearing her pride despite her hopelessness. She admits that she did target him because of his looks, but it's true that paying Carlo is the only way to get her daughter back. She says she wasn't wrong in choosing him, but made a mistake by not anticipating Carlo's greed. Finally clearing things up between them, they decide to focus on the problem at hand. Carlo. Scott decides to invite her to his hotel for better accommodations. There, they discuss Scott's shady livelihood. But they can't deny that they have been yearning for each other since the start. They give in to their impulses and make love to each other that night. Afterward, Scott makes a call to his associate to ask how much money he has. He's decided to fully help Monica, and whether he's wrong in doing so, he'll only find out in the end. Meanwhile, Julia has become a ghost of herself ever since she missed her psychiatric appointment. It even comes to a point where she breaks down upon seeing dozens of vases of white roses in the same suite where she lost the paper. It's just so ironic how anyone can still feel good with all these flowers while she suffers from her shortcomings. Soon, she makes the decision to finally visit Rick and their son despite court orders. Rick lets her in. Julia pleads her case, saying she only wants to see her son. She also apologizes for cheating on him, which was a factor in their divorce. But Rick is adamant not to let her near their child. He's also tired of Julia not owning up to her mistakes because he strongly believes it was her neglect that caused the incident. 
he strikes up a deal with her. If she tells him the truth, he can allow her to see their child. At first, she only admits it's her fault because she thinks that's what Rick wants to hear. But later, she fully recounts the incident. Their son wanted to play ghost by wearing dry cleaning bags on his head. He was hiding in the closet and accidentally got suffocated. Julia managed to save him. But ever since then, she's carried the guilt of not being a better parent. This eventually leads to their separation. Now that Rick knows the truth, he thanks Julia for her honesty. But he declares he's never going to let her see their son again. He pulls Julia toward the door. She puts up a fight as she screams and holds on to anything. Sam, who is with the boy, understands Julia's pain, having met her earlier. She holds Rick against the wall while encouraging the boy to run to his mother. The boy reaches Julia just as the elevator door closes. Rick runs along the stairs, hoping to catch up to them. As he reaches the ground floor, he sees Julia running out of the building, without their son. He sees the boy inside the elevator, clinging to the stuffed toy his mother gave him. Later that night, Sam gives Rick a glass of milk. She says the boy asked her to pour it for him. Apparently, Julia told her son to take care of his father, but the boy doesn't know how to tell Rick. So he asks Sam to relay it. Rick muses about Julia's intentions, especially since she never really said sorry. The next day, Rick gives in to his ex-wife's wishes. He calls her, telling her he'll allow her to visit their son with supervision. But his call goes to voicemail, as Julia has decided it's time for her to leave town. After deciding to withdraw most of his money, Scott meets Monica again at a wharf. He'd seen Carlo arrive there earlier, evidently waiting for them. It's now clear to him that he's being scammed. Still, he can't just let Monica go. He tells her what he knows, and offers her the bag of money. He says she can take it and go, or she can take it and come with him. Monica says he's crazy, and accuses him of not believing her daughter exists, but Scott says he's going to believe she does. This takes Monica aback, as she can see the sincerity and plea in his eyes. She takes the bag and walks away, trying not to look back. That night, Scott calls his wife, who turns out to be Teresa. He feels broken as he asks her how he can forgive himself. We learn that their daughter passed away due to drowning. Teresa blames Scott's negligence because he was supposed to look after their daughter. However, he walked away to answer a business call. Now we understand that the recorded messages Scott has been listening to were all made prior to the daughter's passing. Teresa tells him he may forgive himself, but she never will. Then she ends the call. Scott looks so lost now that he admits to himself that he was largely responsible for what happened. However, he decides to start over. Even if Monica doesn't return to him, he can still live his life in atonement. To his surprise, Monica knocks on his door the next day. She says she's given the money to Carlo. Then she asks if he can still take her, without asking questions. Scott says he has nothing left now. He says yes. Then we see the two of them driving away. Now back to our protagonist, Michael. Once Anna has bounced back to her former, happier self, the two decide to spend some time at a coffee shop. While Anna is looking around, Michael receives a call from Elaine. She just came from a swim in their pool, feeling lighter now that she's faced her fears. Apparently, she's read the complete draft of his novel. She knows exactly how Michael is using his experiences as the core of the novel, especially about their son, Robbie. She also knows that he's used the story of his Anna to drive the plot. Michael admits he never told Anna that he was going to reveal her relationship with her father through his novel. He also admits that, when their son drowned, it wasn't a business call he was taking, as he previously claimed. His confession looks so bland, one might think he's reciting from a script. He looks at Anna, who looks horrified at what he's done. He ends the call to follow Anna, who runs away from him. Through the crowd, Anna changes into Monica, then into Julia. Then, at last, Robbie appears by the fountain, looking at him intently. At this point in the movie, one may be confused as to why characters are suddenly disappearing, or what their connections to each other could be. The truth is that Julia, Scott, and the others are all characters in his novel. As mentioned earlier, Michael writes his characters in the third person to process his emotions because of his inability to communicate his emotions. Julia and her story arc represent his denial of his role in his son's passing. Scott's story reflects his relationships and their crumbling foundations because of his infidelity. Lastly, the storyline of Anna may or may not have been based on his real myths, but her story and the way his imaginary self interacted with her examine how he really deals with his emotions. By the end of the movie, we are left to conclude whether Elaine is real, or if the daughter even exists.